Okay, so the next chapter we're going to discuss is chapter three, and it's all about infancy. So we'll start with physical development. And when it comes to infant uh, physical developmental growth, um, it, infants typically grow very rapidly in the first uh, two years of their life. They increase significantly as far as their birth weight goes. Um, they get much larger in length. And then um, their head also tends to grow a little bit slower than some of the rest of the parts of their body. So if you take a look at that chart that's right there in front of you, you can see a lot of key things that are you are told. So first off, by five months, birth weight has doubled. By one year, birth weight has tripled. By the end of the second year of life, birth weight has quadrupled. And by the end of the first year, the average by uh, the average baby is about uh, if you look at the chart about 30 inches um, tall and by the end of the second year the child is about three feet tall when it comes to gender and ethnic differences there are some things that researchers have noted girls tend to be shorter than boys asian infants tend to be smaller than north american caucasian infants and African-American infants uh, tend to be bigger than North American Caucasian infants. There are four principles of growth that also have to do with how a child um, develops physically. So there's the cephalocaudal principle, the proximodistal principle, and the principle of hierarchical integration and the principle of independence of systems, which all tell us something about the growth of the child. So for the cephalocaudal principle, it states that the growth follows a direction and pattern that begins with the head and the upper body parts and then proceeds to the rest of the body. The proximodistal principle states that the development proceeds from the center of the body and then goes outward the principle of hierarchical integration states uh, that simple skills typically develop separately and independently, but that these simple skills are integrated into more complex ones. And the principle of the independence of systems suggests that different body systems grow at different rates. So when we start to think about um, physical development, we also have to think about the nervous system and how brain cells and nerves begin to develop. So when infants are first born, they're born with 100 or to 200 billion neurons. And these are the basic cells of the nervous system. We have dendrites that receive messages, axons that send messages, and the communication between those cells that happen do so through the use of chemicals called neurotransmitters. And then the synapse is a small gap that exists between cells. So here's an example, if you remember from general psychology, of the basic structure of a neuron. And these uh, neurons help us function. So you can see at birth, over the first two years of life, those neural networks becoming increasingly more connected. And um, as we tend to grow and to develop, we are able to establish more of those connections. Synaptic pruning occurs when um, cells that aren't needed die off, like cells that aren't being used. If you've ever heard the phrase, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Um, that's what synaptic pruning is about. Neurons are also going to increase in size and they are arranged by their functioning. So they're gonna move uh, to the cerebral cortex, which is the upper layer of the brain. Some of the subcortical levels um, can also be used to regulate basic functions. So here we can see um, an, a CT scan of a brain injury, and this is the brain injury of a child who may have been abused by a caretaker for, and suffered what's called a shaken baby syndrome. We can see those uh, red areas indicate, you know, there's some bleeding and that babies' uh, brains are sensitive to injury. And um, there can also be other environmental influences on brain development, such as plasticity, a sensitive period, and uh, brain development. Plasticity refers to the degree in which the brain is susceptible to different experiences, how it can change and grow. And it's the greatest during the first several years of life. 
because that's when most of the learning takes place. A sensitive period is a time when an organism is particularly susceptible to some type of environmental influence, like malnutrition and things of that nature. And we know that brain development can also be supported by cuddling, talking, singing, and playing with babies. That's why we always wanna make sure that we, we interact with them. Rhythms are repetitive cyclical patterns of behavior um, that sometimes uh, the body gets into. And when it comes to sleep, newborns typically sleep between 16 and 17 hours every day. Um, their sleep stages are fitful and out of sync during those early infancy years. That's why they'll wake up all hours of the night. Most of them won't sleep through the night for several months. Rapid eye movement sleep, which is dream sleep, can take place for infants, and it usually takes up half of their sleep. Those infant brain waves are different um, from the dreaming sleep of adults. Audio stimulation is the brain stimulating itself, and then there are some cultural patterns and practices that might also affect the sleep patterns of children. So we talked earlier about sudden uh, inf shaken baby syndrome, but now let's talk a little bit about sudden infant death syndrome, which is SIDS. It's um, the silent or unanticipated killer because this occurs when there's an unexplained death of a seemingly healthy baby. It typically affects about 2,500 infants in the United States every year, and we know that number is way too high. There is no cause to SIDS. Um, Researchers have gone back and forth on how babies should sleep, and they kind of landed on the fact that babies should sleep um, on their back to decrease the incidence of SIDS. And it is the leading cause of death in the first year of life. And if we look at that chart, we can see that in 1990, uh, the incidence of SIDS um, decreased significantly because there was more of a focus on babies sleeping on their backs. Human babies grow rapidly and hide in weight. We're going to review over some things real quick. And we've got some ma major principles that govern the growth of a baby. We know that the brain develops many neurons, billions of them. Babies must develop certain rhythms uh, as they sleep and their reflexes, which are unlearned, are automatic responses like grabbing something and that help them protect themselves. They also start to develop gross uh, motor and fine motor skills that help them proceed along with what they're doing. Having adequate nutrition is um, essential for babies being able to develop uh, physically. Infants can see de depth and motion. They can distinguish colors and patterns. They can see clear visual preferences. They can hear sound. They can recognize sound and smell. Although their visual senses aren't fully developed when they're first born, they quickly do develop. So if we look at a multimodal approach to perception, that considers how information is collected by those senses and integrated and coordinated in other areas of life. So let's go ahead and do a check of understanding. The question is the process that allows established neurons to build stronger networks and reduces unnecessary neurons during the first few years of life is called A, B, C, or D. To take a few moments and think about it. The key here is unnecessary neurons, and you should know that D, synaptic pruning, because that's what happens when we get rid of all the neurons we don't need. Here's the second question. Behavior becomes integrated through the development of blank, which are repetitive cyclical patterns of behavior. And repetitive cyclical patterns of behaviors are B rhythms. Now let's talk a bit about infant motor development. So how do they move? So the basic reflexes of babies are unlearned, they're organized, they're involuntary. So babies naturally have the swim reflex. That's why a lot of parents will teach their babies when they're young. They can naturally blink their eyes. And some of those reflexes stay throughout life and some disappear. Like swimming reflex, for example, disappears unless there are swimming lessons that are provided. There are some ethnic and cultural differences when it comes to physical skills as well. 
So there's a lot of cultural variations in the way uh, reflexes could be displayed. For example, the moral reflex in Caucasian infants, this display differs from that of Navajo babies. Also, when it comes to gross motor skills, by six months, infants can usually move by themselves. They can crawl between eight and 10 months. They usually can support themselves on furniture and walk around the furniture by nine months. And by a year of age, most of them are walking alone and they can sit unsupported by about six months of age. When it comes to those fine motor skills, by three months, infants can coordinate movements of their limbs and start to move their legs and arms around. They can grab objects by 11 months. By age two, they can drink without, from a cup without spilling it. And their motor skills develop, follow a sequential pattern. So if you look at the chart, you can see by months, by 33 months, then they can imitate a circle. When it comes to some developmental norms, we have to compare the individual to the group. So there are a few tests that will help us assess things to determine if a baby is developing properly. And one of them is the NBAS scale, which in, looks at how well an infant interacts with others, develops motorly, uh, physiologically, and how they respond to stress. Also, when we think of specific motor skills that emerge, it can be a part of determined, that's determined by various cultural factors, activities that are intrinsic to a culture are purposely taught, and some emerge earlier, and some genetics constraints can limit how early skills uh, might emerge in a person. When it comes to nutrition in infancy, we have to think about how we can fuel motor development. Malnutrition occurs when a person doesn't have the correct number of nutrients, and that can lead to sudden growth, um, issues with the stomach, the limbs, face swelling, and water retention, and something that we call non-organic failure to thrive when a child does not grow properly. Obesity could also be a problem, and obesity occurs when weight is greater than 20% above average for height. It may make a baby predisposed to adult obesity, and parents can focus and guide their nutrition choices. So for the first 12 months, it's thought that breast milk or formula is the best. It has all the new essential nutrients, makes the baby naturally immune to things, is easily digestible and can enhance cognitive growth. Usually children are introduced to solid foods around about six months of age. Um, gradually they should be introduced. Research has shown us that they should gradually be introduced to foods to avoid allergies. So it used to be, oh, don't give them nuts and eggs and things. And now parents are asked to give them a little bit of peanut butter, give them some eggs so that they don't develop those allergies later. So as we review, here are some points. I won't read over those. You guys can see them, the things we just talked about. And let's go ahead and do a check. Which of the following is not one of the consequences of malnutrition during infancy? Go ahead and take a look at those and choose A, B, C, or D. And the correct answer you should have gotten is A, malnutritious children, malnutritious children are more likely to become obese in adolescence and develop diabetes. That would probably be obese children who experience that. Now let's talk a little bit about how uh, physical development happens with the senses during infancy. So first off, a sensation is the stimulation of the sense organs. And a perception is our interpretation and analysis of that sensory stimulus. We have visual perceptions, which is our ability to see. At first, as I mentioned before, babies, newborns can't really see beyond 20 feet. But by six months of age, um, their vision is 20-20. Depth perception typically develops at about six months of age. Infants prefer patterns and, and complex stimuli. Infants prefer to look at faces as well because they can see uh, faces a lot better than they can do some other things.
when it comes to auditory perception and the world of sound, hearing typically begins prenatally. Babies are sensitive to high and low frequencies, but not middle ranges. Sound localization permits infants to know where sound comes from. It's poorer in infants than adults, but it reaches adult capacity within one year of age. When it comes to smell and taste, infants typically react to unpleasant tastes and smells and they'll have a gag reflex. New, newborns can detect their mother's smell, but only when breastfed. Infants have an innate sweet tooth, so they love eating things that are sweet. They also are um, sensitive to pain and can feel pain from birth. Um, birth can be a very traumatic thing coming into the world. There's a developmental progression of reactions to pain. And exposure to pain in infancy may lead to being more sensitive to pain as an adult. When it comes to responding to touch, most infants are highly have highly developed senses and the rooting rep reflex is strong and they might jerk away when touched and they often also learn about the world through touch. Individual sensory systems are integrated and coordinated in infants and their growth is often aided by affordances. So parents should ensure that their infants receive physical and sensory sim stimulation, carry the baby in different positions, let the infant explore their environment, <clears throat> let them engage in rough and tumble play, let them touch their food and play with it and toys so that they'll know how different things feel. Early, very early on, infants can also um, see depth and motion, distinguish between patterns and colors, show visual preferences, recognize sound and smell, and sense pain and touch. So here's a check of your understanding. Blank is the physical stimulation of the sense organs. Go ahead and take a few moments to think about the correct answer. And that would be D, sensation. Now let's move on to cognitive development and how babies, infants think. So we can't talk about cognitive development without talking about John Piaget's um, stages of uh, cognitive development, sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. These are the stages that assume that all children pass these stages in a fixed order. And movement through these stages typically occurs with physical maturation and the experience with the environment. Piaget believed infants have uh, mental structures called schemes or schemas, and they're organized patterns of viewing situations. And children can either learn to assimilate or accommodate. When a child assimilates, they understand and experience in terms of their current stage of cognitive development. And when they accommodate, they change their existing ways of thinking about a situation and in to what to accommodate to what their new experiences are. So they make room for a new experience in thinking. Here are some of the key elements of Piaget's theory. He says first there's simple reflexes, then there are habits, then there are secondary reactions, coordination of secondary uh, reactions, tertiary reactions, and then the beginning of thought. Most people believe Piaget's descriptions are accurate and that children learn about the world by acting on objects in their environment. And this provides a great framework for understanding how development works. Some people also criticize Piaget because they believe that development is continuous and it's not defined to stages and that Piaget's motor theories ignore the role of sensation and perception. They believe that object permanence and imitation occur earlier than Piaget thought and they also believe that some development is universal and some objects, some are subject to cultural variations. So here's some review points about Piaget's theory of cognitive development. I'll let you read over those. And here are the rest of those ideas as well. And let's go ahead and do a check. So according to Piaget, children can move from one cognitive stage to another 
only when a child blank and is exposed to relevant experiences. So think about that for one, seven, one second. So the correct answer would be D, reaches an appropriate level of physical maturation because according to Piaget, you had to move from one cognitive stage to another along with your physical maturation. Now let's talk about information processing approaches. So information processing has three basic aspects, encoding, storage, and retrieval. So automation occurs um, when we have an activity that requires attention and we have to help children by automatically priming them. Children will learn those complex skills automatically due to some of the priming that takes place. When it comes to the memory capabilities in infants, they can memorize things and as they age, their brain develops more and they can have more memories. Brain scan technology suggests that there are two systems for long-term memory. There's implicit memory and explicit memory. So those implicit memories are gonna be the things that we're not consciously aware of. And those explicit memories are gonna be things that if we think about it, we can recall. It's hard really to determine how intelligent an infant is. We don't even measure intelligence until about the age of six. We do know that there are some ways that we can measure development and that's how we do that to determine if children are meeting developmental milestones. So here's an example of some of the ways we can detect differences that exist between children when they are infants. Here are some of the sample items from the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, one of the most popular scales. Like, can children do this? When you take your child to the doctor, these might be things they look at. And then we also have information processes approaches to individual differences in intelligence. There are some contemporary approaches which measure how quickly infants process information. There's visual recognition memory, and these measures can correlate well with later measures of intelligence. We can also assess information processing by looking at quantitative changes, not qualitative changes. So we want to look at the numbers and actually see what's taking place. We have to realize that cognitive development is more gradual, and we have to use precise measures when we're looking at different cognitive abilities. All right, so we also can think about um, development and how we can promote infant cognitive development. We can give them an opportunity to explore the world. We can be responsive to their needs. We can read to them. We can use cause and effect games. We shouldn't push them or expect too much out of them. And you don't even have to be with them 24 hours a day for them to learn. So here's some review of information from information processing. I'll let you take a look at that on your own. Here are some additional review items. And here's a check to see if you understand. Unlike Piaget's approach to cognitive development, which stresses the blank changes that occur in infants' capabilities, the information processing approach to cognitive development emphasizes the blank changes. So what would be the correct answer? So hopefully you got B as the correct answer. Piaget emphasizes qualitative changes and um, the information processing approach looks at those quantitative changes and looks at the numbers. Now let's talk about language development. Language is the systematic, meaningful arrangement of symbols and provides the basis for communication. Language has both formal characteristics that must be learned, and it should also be tied to how infants think and understand the world so that they can comprehend and produce uh, different forms of speech. So children usually start babbling around two to three months of age and that's kind of a universal language of sounds then about six months that babbling starts to become more like their home language the language they hear all the time 
Infants who cannot hear aren't exposed to sign language, babble as well with their hands. And in general, most kids are going to speak their first words between 10 and 14 months of age. Their first words are usually, usually holographic speech. So milk to indicate I want some milk. And by 15 months of age, their vocabulary is about 10, month, uh, 10 words. By two years of age, they have over 400 words and culture will impact their use of words. By age two, infants start to string those words together, together into what we call telegraphic speech, where they can underextend, which they can overly restrict the use of words, or they can overextend, which is when they are broad, when they have a broad or generalized use of the meaning of words. They also can engage in referential style, which is used primarily to label objects. And they can use expressive styles, which is primarily used to express their feelings and their needs. So learning is a is language is a learned skill and it's followed by lots of reinforcement and conditioning and shaping. So as children get close to saying the right things, reinforcing that. It does not explain how children learn grammar and it doesn't explain how they produce um, different phrases. Noam Chomsky um, championed the idea of a native, nativist approach to learning. He argued that genetics and innate mechanisms a direct language development. And um, he also said that we have some neural systems in the brain that permit our understanding of language. Critics believe that um, primates can be, can be taught to talk that brings a uniqueness to human linguistics, and many of them identify mechanisms other than the language acquisition device as a way to understand speech and sound. Supporters believe there's a specific gene that's found that relates to speech production, and infants and adult speeches uh, processing of information are very similar. Their interactionist approach um, looks at combining genetics and the environment. Infant-directed speech is the type of speech directed towards infants. Uh, previously, it had been called mother ease, which was high-pitched, um, sing-song. Infants are receptive to that type of speech, and they tend to use it early in life to understand words. There are many cross-cultural similarities when it comes to speech production. Some facets of language are spe specific to particular types of interactions, and the mother's pitch um, rises to get the infant's uh, attention. So here's a review of some of the elements of language. Here is some additional review. And I've got to check for understanding. Like other two-year-olds, Mason can say doggy, bye-bye, and milk, gone. These two-word phrases are example of A, B, C, or D. Which one do you think is correct? The correct answer is B, telegraphic speech. And then the second question, one theory, the blank approach suggests that genetically determined innate mechanisms direct our language development. So the A, B, C, or D. And the correct answer is A, the nativist approach, Noam Chomsky. Now let's talk about a little bit of social development. Across cultures, infants show facial expressions to define basic emotions, and um, in, infants engage in nonverbal expressions to show interest, distress, and disgust that are often present at birth. Darwin argued that humans and primates have universal sets of emotional expression and children in different cultures can show differences in their level of emotional expression. Stranger anxiety and separation anxiety exists when um, babies are weary of strangers. It typically appears in the second half of the first year of life because infants can then start to discriminate between people they know and people they don't know. Between six and eight weeks, babies will start to smile and engage in a social smile by responding to another person. By age two, they can be more purposeful in their smiling. 
Infants um, do have nonverbal decoding ability. So by four months of age, they can begin to understand emotions behind different expressions we have. They can also have intentional search for information to help explain the meaning of certain circumstances and events. This usually occurs between eight and nine months. They can understand how other people feel and engage in social referencing. Infants also have self-awareness when they look in a mirror and they can see themselves. They can touch their nose by about 17 to 24 months. And the theory of mind says their knowledge and beliefs about the mental world occur early in infancy. This is the knowledge and belief that infants see others as compliant agents and beings that are similar to themselves who behave under their own power and respond to the infant's request. That's kind of how they view what should happen. So here's a review of sociability in infants. And here's a check. When Darius bumped his knee on the table, he gazed at his mother to look at her reaction. When he saw that she was alarmed, he began crying. What is this an example of? Hopefully you came up with C, social referencing. He didn't know how to respond to that situation and he decided how to respond based on his mother's reaction. Now let's talk about how infants form relationships with other people. They do so through attachment, which is the most important form of social development. So, um, Sigmund Freud suggested that attachment grew from the mother satisfying the infant's oral needs. Um, Lorenz said that um, imprint, imprinting is what led to attachment, and Bowlby argued that attachment is biological because the mother provides safety and security. It's different from everybody else. And he also believed that having a strong, firm attachment provides a good home base. Some of the most popular research when it comes to attachment was done by Mary Ainsworth in her strange situation um, example when she looked at a sequence of sage episodes and came up with secure, avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized levels of attachment. So according to Ainsworth, an infant attachment has consequences for relationships that occur later on in life. How a child is able to attach to the adults in their life will indicate how they're able to attach to others later on. One particular thing that can develop, develop if a child does not appropriately attach to others is something called reactive attachment disorder, which is usually the result of abuse and neglect as a child. It can lead to feeding difficulties, um, unresponsiveness to other social overtures, and a general failure to thrive. And infants who have experienced um, neglect and develop reactive attachment disorders, they grow up to be adults who still have some of those same issues. So when it comes to mothers and attachment, there's a sensitivity to the needs um, that's hallmarked to a secure attachment, which is usually brought on by the mother. A mother is usually aware of a child's mood and knows how to provide appropriate responses. Um, and that usually contributes to a good secure attachment between a mother and a child. When it comes to fathers, there's changing societal norms which show infants strongly attached to many of their fathers, but parental involvement could reduce depression and substance abuse, and children's emotional well-being enhance, is enhanced by their father's expression of nurturance, warmth, affection, support, and concern for what they go through. Sometimes we can see some cultural differences when it comes to attachment. Infants who fail in various attachment categories could have some differences culturally. Attachment can be seen as susceptible to cultural norms and expectations. Secure attachment can be seen earlier in cultures that foster independence. And secure attachment could be delayed in cultures that don't foster independence. Infants tend to react positively to the presence of other infants and the smile. They begin to show preferences for familiar people. And by 14 months, they can imitate each other. And we know that there are areas of the brain that will mirror and we can see activation because that shows us that they're relating to other people. So here's a review of how infants form relationships. And let's do a little check. One way mothers can improve the likelihood of secure attachment in their children is to respond to their needs appropriately. 
Another name for this communication in which mothers and children match emotional states is A, B, C, or D. And hopefully you came up with C, interactional synchrony. Now let's talk about some differences that might exist in infants. So according to Eric Erickson, he said that we have some theories of psychosocial development, and that is how we understand ourselves in relation to others. He said that infants have early experiences where they can either develop trust or mistrust within the first 18 months of age. And if they don't, then they may start to doubt other people. Then the next stage he said develops is autonomy versus shame and doubt between 18, and three, 18 months and three years. Do parents encourage them to explore the world or make them feel shameful? We also have to think about temperament, which is a pattern of arousal and emotional stability that are consistent and enduring characteristics of an individual. It's basically how a child behaves. Um, there could be differences among infants um, from, time, from the time they're born until later on in life. And then they can also have a lot of stability from infancy through adolescence. So there are several dimensions that impact temperament, such as activity level, and then also irritability. And the typical temperament levels are easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. Um, and about 40% of children are easy children. 10% are difficult children. 15% are slow to warm up. And the other 35% really can't be characterized. There are um, no temperament is thought to be inherently good or bad. Um, there's long-term adjustment that depends on goodness of fit, and it's often the key determinant in how parents react to their child. Gender, is the sense of being male or female, has effects throughout life. Fathers tend to interact more with their sons than daughters, and mothers tend to act, react more to their daughters than sons. Infants tend to wear different clothing and play with different toys based on their gender. And infants' behavior is interpreted differently based on their gender, and that can impact what um, gender children feel comfortable with. Males are more active and fussier than females. By age one, infants distinguish uh, male from female. Differences in gender is larger than between, than between genders and gender is influenced by gender roles and what takes place in the household. There could also be some differences due to prenatal exposure to various hormones. When we think of family life in the 21st century, about one third of families are headed by a single parent. Family size is shrinking from 3.1 to 2.5 persons. Adolescents give birth, giving birth has declined over the last five years with 57% of mothers of infants who work outside the home 43% of children who live in low-income households, 69% of African-American children, and 63% of Hispanic uh, children live in low-income households. So more than 80% of infants are cared, by people, cared for by people other than their mothers in the first year. The majority of these infants um, start child care before four months and are enrolled in almost 30 hours of school a week. There's usually high quality child care that leads um, to only minor differences in children and children from low income homes show benefits of child care as well as children from high income homes. Children in child care may be less secure, have less effective time management skills and lower abilities to work independently. There was a research study done in 2007 that shows children may be more likely to be disruptive in class if they've been cared for by people other than their mother um, within the first year of life. So here are some questions um, for you to consider when it comes to infant um, child care providers. Um, we know that there's a big issue with providers and even paying for it. What should the hours be? Uh, what do caregivers do during the day? And parents spend a lot of money trying to get their children the best care possible. So here's a review over some differences that may exist between infants. Here's some other review questions. And then I've got a couple of checks for you. Here's the first one. Patterns of arousal and emotionality that are consistent and enduring in an individual are known as an individual's what? 
A, B, C, or D? And the correct answer is B, temperament. Here's the second question. Research finds that high quality child care outside the home may A, B, C, or D. And the correct answer is D. So I hope all of the things we went through was helpful in you for you in understanding the information in chapter 